Bien, nuestra siguiente invitada es para Educarred una referente absoluta. Es la creadora, la autora, de un modelo que se llama TIPAC, un nombre un poco extraño, pero que ella, dentro de un momento, nos lo va a explicar. Mirad, en William and Mary saben que una cola no mueve al perro y que los enfoques desde los cuales se parta condicionan la percepción que tenemos de la realidad. Estamos hablando de conceptos un poco extraños, ¿no? pero enseguida entenderemos por qué los puntos de partida, los puntos de arranque, son vitales para las percepciones que tenemos de todo lo que nos rodea. En realidad estamos hablando de si el ordenador tiene que configurar el diseño del nuevo sistema educativo. Bien, eh, está claro que las herramientas digitales eh, son vitales en este momento y que posibilitan nuevas formas de aprendizaje, nuevas formas de enseñanza, es decir, eh, son eficaces tanto para los alumnos como para los profesores. Pero, claro, cuando alguien tiene un martillo en la mano, corre el riesgo de pensar que todo lo que le rodea es un clavo cuando hay cosas que no lo son. Es decir, tenemos que saber de herramientas, tenemos que saber de tecnología, pero también tenemos que pensar en cómo vamos a enseñar, es decir, tenemos que saber de pedagogía y también sobre qué contenidos vamos a enseñar. En la intersección entre la tecnología, los contenidos y las herramientas y la pedagogía está el corazón del modelo que nos propone Judy Harris, nuestra siguiente invitada. Dice el tango que 20 años no es nada. Bueno, depende de para qué, ¿no? Si esos 20 años yo le añado otros 10, la ecuación, la suma, me da como resultado los 30 años que Judy Harris lleva analizando este fenómeno y proponiendo y trabajando este modelo TIPAC. Por cierto, William and Mary es el nombre de la escuela en la que nuestra siguiente invitada trabaja. Con todos vosotros, Judy Harris. Well, good morning. Good morning. I'm very pleased to be here today. I've come a long way to talk with what I understand to be a group of very inspired and motivated teachers. Is this true? Yes. So how many of you have used digital technologies of one type or another in your teaching? Okay, good. How many of you have helped other teachers, whether formally as part of your job or informally, uh, just as colleagues, you've helped other teachers to use digital technologies in their teaching? Okay, good, good. So what I'm going to do today is to speak with you more as teachers who help other teachers to learn to use digital tools and resources in their teaching more that than teaching than speaking to you as someone who use them, uses them in your own classroom. Because um, as I think I understood the introduction to say, I'm not sure what the introduction said, unfortunately, but as I think I understood the introduction to say, um, what I'm going to share with you today is a way of thinking about the knowledge that teachers need to be able to um, integrate use of digital tools and resources into the teaching. It's a very new way of thinking about doing this. So, um, the title um, of the talk, as you can see, is a bit of a metaphor, and I'll explain this in just a moment. But to begin, what I'd like to do is to share a brief video with you that um, I think represents a basic idea of what I'd like to share with you today. So here we go. 
It's a commercial that um, has been shown for the last couple of years um, in the United States. Perhaps you've seen it. This is a classical design we did in Milan. It's a postmodern residence in Milan. Design won five prestigious awards. Haki headquarters in Kyoto. To see our architecture, you don't look around the corner, you look around the world. So, what can I do for you? Design a house around this. So the woman says, design a house around a faucet, speaking to an architect. Well, that's an, a strange thing, a strange request to make. But what I'd like to suggest is that analogously, for about 25 to 30 years, we as teachers have been asked to do something very similar. We've been asked to design lessons for our students, learning experiences for our students, around a tool, around a computer, for example, or around a particular piece of software. That doesn't work, frankly. We've tried it for many years. We've tried to look at these tools that are so incredibly powerful, that have so many affordances. We look to the tools, we see how powerful they are, we get excited about the possibilities. And so, um, it's only human nature to try to think about how to use those tools in our teaching. Unfortunately, though it sort of makes sense to do that, it really doesn't work very well in most of the classrooms. In classrooms like yours, people who have the passion, who believe in the power of these tools, who have seen what they can accomplish, You've seen that in your own practice. Unfortunately, as you probably know, many of your colleagues are not convinced. They're not seeing the same kinds of potential that you are. We began to understand this as educational technology researchers probably about 10 to 15 years ago. Whenever we teach teachers how to use new tools, and then we ask them to find uses for them in their classrooms, there are some teachers who do a wonderful job with that, but the great majority don't. Because it's not about designing lessons around the tools. It's about designing lessons and units and projects according to our students' learning needs. So this new way of thinking about technology integration, this new way of thinking about how to help teachers to use digital tools and resources in their classrooms successfully is what I'll share with you now. The way that we've been doing it, we have an expression in the US, the way that we've been doing it is sort of like the tail wagging the dog, right? What instead we need to do is to focus on the students' curriculum-based learning needs, not on the tools themselves. So here's an example. The, the more traditional way of, of, uh, of looking to tools um, for suggestions about how to use them, for example, is looking to Second Life. How many of you have seen Second Life, the simulation online? Just a few. It's a, it's a, a simulation that's growing in popularity. There are a lot of teachers uh, in the US and Canada who are starting to experiment with this particular immersive online simulation. So in the traditional way of, using, of thinking about using tools and resources in the classroom, a teacher would look at Second Life, see how powerful it is, see how motivating it could be, for her students to use, and she would think to herself, hmm, we have a unit in ancient history that I'm planning for my students. Why don't my students build something in Second Life? Uh, maybe a town in Second Life, or no, 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 maybe a building. So because my students are studying about ancient Egyptian civilization, why don't I get them to build a town or a building um, in ancient Egypt in this particular simulation? 
And for a long time, we thought, oh, that's an, that's an acceptable way to integrate technologies into education. Unfortunately, there are only a few teachers, percentage-wise, maybe two to three percent of teachers who are willing to find uses for tools in this particular way. So there's a different way to approach this that I'd like to share with you. The, the way that I just described, the, the example that I just gave, the way that we've been thinking about um, uh, integrating technologies into teaching and learning is one that focuses on the technology. Seymour Papert from the Massachusetts Institute for Technology, MIT, called this technocentric. We center on the technologies, on the aspects of the technologies that can help us to do things. This is not very effective. We've tried for about 25 years to integrate use of digital tools and resources into classrooms all over the world, and there really are not a majority of classrooms in which powerful things are happening with these digital tools. So a number of us researchers began thinking, what might be going wrong, started questioning our approach. And we've come up with an approach that we think is much more successful with a greater majority of teachers. In this particular approach, we begin instead of with the tool and its affordances, we begin with the curriculum. So for example, this is just from where I live in the state of Virginia uh, in the United States. Part of the curriculum that's required when students study about ancient Egypt includes these particular content uh, and process standards. So that's what teachers normally do. We begin with what it is that the students need to learn, content and process. Teachers don't stop with that, though. They need to think about contextual um, situations, like how much time is available um, in the schedule for this particular lesson, project, or unit. They also, most importantly, need to think about their students. How are they going to react based on past experience? So instead of starting with the technology, TPAC, um, as was introduced, is a way of thinking about students' learning needs first and primarily, and then weaving use of the technologies into those particular plans. So let me explain a bit about what this knowledge that's needed, um, what we've discovered uh, about it. There are basically three types of knowledge that teachers need in order to be able to integrate uh, digital tools and resources successfully into their teaching. They, of course, need technological knowledge. They need to know about the tools themselves. They do need to know how to operate them. They need to know what they can do, their affordances, and what they're not so good at doing, their constraints. Unfortunately, in many places in the world, this knowledge is the kind of knowledge that we focus upon when we teach teachers how to use these tools in their classroom. And this is by far not enough. In addition to having knowledge about the technologies themselves, teachers also need knowledge about pedagogy, about teaching. In this case, it might be general teaching approaches, things like classroom management, um, how to group students in different ways for different kinds of learning activities. Teachers also obviously need content or curriculum knowledge, knowledge about what it is that they're going to be teaching. But what's particularly interesting about this model, this TPAC model, are the intersections. So in 1986 and 1987, a researcher in the U.S. named Lee Shulman realized that teachers not only needed general pedagogical knowledge and content knowledge, the teachers needed a very specialized kind of knowledge that is the intersection of pedagogical and content knowledge. And uh, Dr. Shulman called it pedagogical content knowledge. For example, it's not enough just to know about calculus if you're a math teacher. It's not enough just to know about how to communicate ideas um, about calculus if you're a math teacher. What Dr. Shulman taught us 
Um, and it was a very, very compelling idea, um, compelling enough to change the way that we teach teachers, that we prepare people to become teachers. Dr. Shulman pointed out that there is a special knowledge in the intersection of the two, pedagogical content knowledge, meaning the knowledge that we as teachers need to be able to teach in a particular content area. Because it's very different to teach a first grader how to read very different from teaching a middle school student who's studying history, very different from teaching a high school student who is, for example, doing a biology laboratory experiment. So adding to this notion of pedagogical content knowledge are two researchers, uh, Punya Mishra and Matt Kaler at Michigan State University, who in 2005-2006 realized that with the complexity of digital tools and resources, the kinds of knowledge that teachers need to be able to teach well is added to pedagogical content knowledge. So we then add technological knowledge and we have a whole new set of intersections. We have, for example, technological content knowledge. That is, the knowledge that teachers need to be able to select the most appropriate tools and resources for the content that they're teaching. So that math teacher, for example, who's introducing the uh, concept of a sine wave, a very powerful way to do that is with data sets on a graphing calculator. So that knowledge that that teacher has to choose the graphing calculator and not, for example, the geometer sketch pad, that's an example of technological content knowledge. So in addition to that knowledge, teachers also need technological pedagogical knowledge, uh, Mishra and Kaler said. In other words, ways of teaching using these digital tools. For example, what a colleague of mine calls plan B. What happens if the technology doesn't work the way that you expected it to? What then do you try? Um, uh, if you have your students working, say, in a computer lab with every student on their own computer, uh, a form of technological pedagogical knowledge is how you know how to, um, uh, how they know to tell you that they have a question, how they know to help each other if they need um, some assistance, that kind of information. So all of these types of knowledge intersecting together, when you consider them all together, this is TPAC. This is the knowledge that teachers need in order to be able to integrate use of digital tools and resources in their classroom effectively, to teach their students effectively in curriculum-based ways. Um, in a sense, even though that little intersection in the center is small, TPAC is really all of this. And honestly, when we first, as researchers and people who teach teachers, when we first realized how complex this knowledge is, we began to understand why more classrooms don't display very powerful uses of technologies. To put it very slim, simply, it's a lot harder than we originally thought it was. And once we realized how complex this knowledge that teachers need, that you have, um, how complex this knowledge is, uh, what teachers need to, to know and to be able to do to work with digital tools effectively in the classroom, we realized that it is an order more complex because that knowledge that teachers need is situated within the multiple contextual uh, complexities that we encounter in every classroom and every school. So um, contextual situations like what technologies are available, what's the level of access, what's the physical space like, what kinds of cultural diversity are represented um, in the class, what time is available, what kinds of um, uh, um, interactions with families and neighborhoods do we need to consider? What are students' attitudes? The list goes on and on. So as complex as technology integration knowledge, TPAC is, it's that much more complex when it becomes situated in the real lives of teachers and students in school. So given that, given that TPAC is 
this very complex knowledge that goes far beyond just knowledge of how to use the tools themselves, how do we help teachers to develop that? So my colleagues and I are focusing on, uh, for the past several years, and will continue on helping teachers to develop their TPAC. There are multiple ways that people have experimented with helping teachers to do this. One of the first ways was a learning by design method, if you have heard of the backwards design um, kinds of planning models. Um, there's a lot of um, inquiry and reflection that's also used, especially with people learning to be teachers to help them to develop their TPAC. One of the most promising ways of helping teachers to develop TPAC is in modeling. Uh, by watching videos or in person of other teachers with well-developed TPAC, um, helping uh, people to see what it looks like in action. There are a number of projects going on now with self-assessment, micro-teaching, uh, sort of like um, critical friends, constructively critical commentary uh, that teachers have um, on teaching typically in video form. And the way that my colleagues and I are working on helping teachers to develop TPAC is through teachers' instructional planning. And I'd like to tell you a little bit more about that. I should also say, by the way, that I'm being careful to keep time at the end for questions uh, and comments. So hopefully, um, if you have those, you'll share those with us. So here's what we know from research about teachers' planning. Um, it's probably a topic for a whole other conversation that we could have because the research here is pretty fascinating and, and somewhat incomplete, unfortunately. We know that teachers' instructional planning is highly situated. It's very much about the students there in their particular school, in their particular area, given their particular curriculum. In that way, teachers' planning is also very contextual. So um, it's rare, if impossible, for teachers to take the same set of plans and use them year after year without some modification because teachers' planning is so situated and contextual. Here's the key for us. What we know from research on teachers' planning is that it's very activity-based, that, that often the way that teachers will think about what it is that they're going to do during a particular unit of study or during a particular lesson is to think about the learning activities that the students are going to participate in. And that becomes a key to how we help teachers, my colleagues and I help teachers, uh, to develop their TPAC. The researchers have also told us that teachers' planning becomes routinized, and this is a very positive aspect of it, um, in that when teachers um, are successful with particular kinds of learning activities, they use their understanding of those activities as sort of a shorthand, um, a way to save time and to make sure that they have more time uh, to pay attention to their students, to meet their students' needs. So we thought, my colleagues and I thought, well, if we know this about teachers' planning, then why don't we develop uh, and test a way to help teachers to develop their TPAC around what we know from research on teachers' planning? So our argument sounds something like this. We know that educational technologies are not well integrated in most classrooms um, in the world yet. We're hopeful that they will be. But since they're not well integrated yet, and since teachers' planning is very focused on content or curriculum and activity-based, since learning activities differ quite substantially by discipline, um, and we do know this from other research about teachers' pedagogical content knowledge, also because technology integration with our new understanding of the knowledge that's necessary to do this well is dependent upon this interdependent technological, pedagogical content and context knowledge. We thought, how about if we teach teachers to develop their TPAC using what we call learning activity types, different types of learning activities. Let me give you some examples here. Um, 
the activity types approach to helping teachers to develop their TPAC is a way to help teachers to integrate technologies well into their classrooms without having to focus primarily on the technologies themselves. Helping the teachers to focus on the curriculum, the content that the students, that they're wanting the students to learn. So the learning activity types are content and competency based. So this is content and process, right? There are taxonomies of learning activity types that my colleagues and I have created and tested for each of uh, now six major content areas that are available, and I'll show you the URL where they're available. They're available free for everyone who wants to use them. Um, and we're in the process of developing four more. Um, so these taxonomies are purposefully meant to be comprehensive, meaning that this is um, a chart, I'll show you in a second, basically of all of the different kinds of learning activities in a particular content area. So right now, for example, we have one taxonomy that addresses mathematics another that addresses science. And this would be from uh, very young children, kindergarten, pre-kindergarten, through grade approximately 12, um, just before college. Um, so mathematics, science, social studies, foreign languages, world languages, and then secondary English language arts and uh, primary English language arts, which we separated into two uh, different taxonomies. Uh, the four that we're uh, working on um, uh, that will be out uh, probably sometime before next summer um, are a taxonomy for English as a second language, a taxonomy for physical education, a taxonomy for visual art, and a taxonomy for music. And then we'll hopefully continue on uh, creating more from there. What we purposely did with these taxonomies was to make them what we call pedagogically inclusive. We think that it's very important um, to have all types of learning activities represented um, in these taxonomies. We want the technology integration to be effective with these tools um, no matter how a particular teacher teaches. We want there to be um, traditional kinds of learning activities for teachers that would prefer to use those and very progressive non-traditional kinds of learning activities for teachers who would prefer to use those. And I'll tell you a little bit about um, what we've experienced with teachers using these in just a moment. So here's an example of just a piece, just a tiny piece of a taxonomy. In this particular case, we do have um, uh, the uh, taxonomy translated into Spanish, um, and these, as I said, are available uh, for you free of charge. Um, the idea in each of the taxonomies, and in social studies, there are about 40 some um, different learning activity types. The idea is very simple. As you can see on the left, there's a name for the particular kind of learning activity. In the middle, in case the teacher using this is not familiar with that particular kind of activity, is a brief description. And then on the right-hand side is a short list of suggested technologies that would support that particular learning activity particularly well. And the idea is that um, if we have a comprehensive taxonomy of all of the different kinds of learning activities in each content area, the idea is simple. Once a teacher has decided on the goals, the learning goals for the particular lesson or learning project or learning unit that he or she is planning, the idea is that they go through the taxonomy and choose which learning activities would be most appropriate for that group of students given those particular learning goals. Then once the teachers choose the activities, because there's a short list of recommended technologies available for each of the activities, it makes the decision about which technologies to use and how to use those technologies much, much simpler.
Perhaps that kind of assistance is not what you would need given your higher levels of experience, but I would be willing to wager that most of your colleagues would need some scaffolding like this, at least in the beginning, to help them with their planning. We'll say more about this in just a moment. The idea here in this particular approach is that teachers build their TPAC, they build that knowledge that is the intersection of technology, pedagogy, and content during instructional planning as they're selecting the learning activities um, for a particular set of learning goals. Once they select the activities and sequence them, then they make the choices in the final column of the technologies to use. And in that way, the technology integration focuses on what the students are learning and how they're learning, as opposed to what we used to do, which was the complete reverse, which was to start with the technology and then try to figure out how to use the technologies in the curriculum. So really, teachers build their TPAC using this method by selecting and sequencing learning activities. Let me make a note here also. Um, we don't have a particular planning method that we advocate. We have designed this particular method to work with any way that, uh, that teachers already plan. But basically, the sequence that you see here is the sequence that we recommend with some possible changes. We recommend that teachers first focus upon choosing the learning outcomes or the learning goals and last choose the tools and resources. Now in some cases teachers might want to choose the learning outcomes then consider the contextual constraints like time and access to tools and students past experience and then the activity types and then the learning assessments or in some cases teachers switch that they first think of the learning outcomes and then the contextual considerations and then the assessments and then the activity types or they might think of the learning outcomes and then the assessments this is pretty popular right now in the US and then think about contextual conditions and then the activity types but the point here is first learning goals, last, selecting the tools. That's very important, we think. We think that selecting the technologies last can be a key to helping instruction to focus on the learning goals, the student-based learning goals, rather than focusing on the technologies. So let me give you an example. Let's say that, that the teacher, that the example that I used in the beginning, the teacher who saw Second Life, the simulation Second Life, and decided that she was going to figure out a way for her students to use it. Instead, using this particular method that we've developed, the teacher would locate the instructional goals for the student's uh, unit on ancient Egypt and then would go into the social studies taxonomy and make a list of all of the possible activity types in the taxonomy that the teacher feels would be appropriate for that particular group of students um, learning at that particular time of the year. So let's say that this is the list of possible activity types. What the teacher then does is go through and eliminate the activity types that aren't a perfect fit, that aren't absolutely appropriate given those learning goals, those particular students, and the teacher's own comfort, competence, and experience. The idea then is to end up with a series of activities and sequence them in a way that makes the most sense for uh, her students' learning. Once the teacher has the list of activities in the sequence um, that he or she thinks will work best, then the teacher looks on the taxonomy to the possible technologies for each and decides which of those technologies to use based on what's available at his or her school, what they prefer to use, what the students have experience with, what they might want to teach the students to use, etc. So again, the teacher, in the same way that she would have eliminated um, some choices from her original list of activity types, does the same thing by eliminating um, possible technologies. And by the way, at this particular stage, the teacher can also um, choose to uh, add 
add technologies that are not even displayed on our taxonomies based on uh, what the teacher prefers to use and what's available. So in the end, the teacher ends up with, in this case it would be for a project, a series of sequenced learning activities based on the content and process learning outcomes that are supported um, by the kinds of technologies that the teacher feels would be most appropriate based on what's available um, in his or her school. So that's basically the the process, it's not very complicated, it's very much on purpose the way teachers tend to plan anyway except with the addition of the scaffolding provided by the taxonomy. So let me give you a look, the, all the taxonomies are available online, I'll show you the URL in just a second, they're all available online, we update them about every two years based on feedback um, and our experience um, uh, using them with teachers, um, but to give you a sense the taxonomies are organized in different content areas somewhat differently. So for example, in social studies, we um, discovered when we worked with social studies curriculum experts that the kinds of learning activities that are used in social studies tend to fall into two big groups one group or category that's more about knowledge building and the other group or category that's more about knowledge expression. The numbers that you see in the parentheses there indicate how many different kinds of learning activities are available um, in each of these particular categories. Now, if you see how social studies is organized, take a look at mathematics. Mathematics is organized completely differently. And by the way, the way that we develop these, like I said, was working with curriculum experts in each of the content areas. We literally developed these from the ground up. We asked our curriculum experts, our collaborators, to bring with them a list of as many different kinds of learning activities in their content area that they could find. And then we started with that whole mess of many different kinds of learning activities um, and we gradually worked our way through them to categorize them sort of from the ground up, uh, like a grounded theory kind of data analysis approach, if you're familiar um, with, uh, with that form of research. So that what we found for each of the taxonomies was that the learning activities are organized very much like the content area itself. So as you can see under mathematics, it's a very process-based taxonomy. Um, there are six different kinds of consider activities, three different kinds of practice activities, all the way down to four different kinds of evaluation and four different kinds of creation activities in mathematics. And then see, compare world languages to social studies and mathematics and you see something somewhat different. Again, this, the reason for the differences in the different disciplines is based upon what Lee Shulman taught us 20 more years ago about pedagogical content knowledge. How you teach in each content area is quite different. Not to mention how you teach at each grade level is quite different. And all we said was we need some way to incorporate that discipline specific knowledge into how teachers um, integrate technologies into their teaching. So those of you who are technology enthusiasts, when I've presented this particular approach um, before to groups of, of technology enthusiasts, perhaps like you, oftentimes the question is, where's the technology? Well, the technology, we believe, is in its right place, its correct place. In a sense, this is a picture of a back door. My students say that, that it's not obvious, so I'll tell you. So, the, the technology should not be driving the instruction. The student's learning needs should, right? So the technology, again, is what we encourage teachers to choose last. Doesn't mean the teachers don't need to learn to use the technologies, doesn't mean that they're any less powerful, but rather, if we focus um, technology integration, professional development on the curriculum and helping teachers to teach students in terms of curriculum based needs, then it's a lot simpler and by the way, we have a lot less resistance from the teachers who are not as convinced as you are about how powerful these tools are um, to be used in teaching. 
So where's the technology? Right there. It's, it's in that column, it's there, but it's aligned with the learning activities themselves. The learning activities are the focus here for this particular um, approach. So very quickly, in addition to developing the taxonomies and doing research, um, there's uh, uh, at the website that I'll show you in a moment, there's uh, reports of our research as we're continuing to do it, um, if you're interested in those, um, uh, in those particular studies. We've also been developing ways to assess teachers TPAC. How do you know what teachers TPAC looks like in practice? How do you know? So, um, we've developed three tools. As a matter of fact, you're the first group that I can talk about the third tool with because we just ran the stats a couple of days ago. Um, and as far as we know, the third tool seems to be working. Um, the work in TPAC over the last six or so years has been very much about the construct, sort of what is that knowledge? And there's still a lot of work going on um, exploring what TPAC is. There's also a fair amount of work, like I introduced before, about developing TPAC. But the work that's just beginning is about assessing TPAC. And I'll just say very br briefly about this because I want to get to your questions, and you can see more excuse me, on the website, um, if you'd like. Um, <coughs> excuse me, to understand teachers' knowledge, there are basically four ways that we can do this. We can observe the uh, teacher's teaching and see indirectly what their knowledge is. We can talk with them in an interview. Uh, we can look at their artifacts. It's especially helpful to look at lesson plans, for example. And we can also ask teachers to self-assess or self-report their knowledge. And all of these ways have been investigated. But what we know for sure is that the best way to understand a teacher's knowledge is by using all of these methods together, triangulating them. So not depending completely on self-report, not depending completely on observation, making sure that we have multiple ways to understand what a teacher's knowledge as applied in practice is. So my colleagues and I have created two different rubrics, thank you, have created two different rubrics that we've tested for reliability and validity and I'm always surprised when independent scorers will um, score the same lesson or the same lesson plan similarly but independently. They have um, high reliability and validity and they're just simple rubrics and you can get them online. You can use them to self-assess your own teaching informally. You can uh, use them with your colleagues or some other people are using them um, in research studies which we're very happy about. Um, they're available at the URL that you see there. There are two rubrics. One basically looks at either lesson plans or teachers' descriptions of lessons that they've taught or projects or units that they've taught um, as a result of an interview, a structured interview question. The other rubric is an observation rubric. So if you were to sit in a classroom and watch a teacher who's teaching with digital tools, you can use that rubric to help uh, you to assess that the level of teacher's TPAC. Um, the place where all of this information uh, resides is on the activity types wiki. Um, and I'll show you at the very end while we're taking questions, we are migrating this wiki to a bigger, better uh, website. We're in the process of doing that. But until then, you can find all of the taxonomies here and also the assessment tools. And they're all released uh, in the uh, spirit of um, uh, Attitude 2.0 uh, sharing. They're all released. Uh, under a Creative Commons license, which means that you can use them for nonprofit purposes um, as much as you'd like. Um, you're encouraged to, as a matter of fact, and uh, we just ask that you attribute the authors whenever you use them. If you reproduce the taxonomies, there's an attribution line at the bottom. Just leave that in there. And we ask, of course, that you don't sell them um, for profit. Um, we also have a TPAC newsletter for those of you that are interested um, in uh, especially TPAC research and development that goes on all over the world. We have about 1,200 subscribers now, completely free electronic mail newsletter. Comes out about every two months um, with updates of all of the new work in TPAC that's happening all over the world. Um, and, you're, and I'll put this up again at the end so that you can copy it if you'd like. You're more than welcome uh, to subscribe. 
Um, I'd like to conclude before your questions by bringing back what I began with. Uh, do you remember? Uh, we asked whether we should design a lesson or a project or a unit around this. And obviously, you know by now that my answer is no, of course not. I'll tell you what we need to design our lessons and projects around. We need to design a lesson around them. Around them. Design a learning project around them, the students. Design a unit of study around them. Design an exploration with them, if you'd like to. Please, design your teaching around and with them, our students. They're what's important. Thanks very much. Pues la verdad es que cuando comprendes la complejidad que tiene todo este proceso, tal y como ha dicho Judy en su charla, te das cuenta porque la introducción de las tecnologías de la información a veces no dan los resultados esperados o no se produce de la manera más eficaz. Yo mmm, voy a trasladar una pregunta. Nos han llegado varias, ¿eh? varias preguntas, pero el tiempo es eh, prioritario en este evento. Y antes de pasar a la pregunta, que yo creo que aglutina muchas de las sugerencias particulares que tenéis cada uno de vosotros, he de decir que Judy va a tener un taller ahora a continuación en la sala multiusos. Son muchos los profesores que se han interesado por compartir con ella y profundizar un poquito más en este modelo TIPAC y en su análisis y pensamiento. Todos aquellos a los que os interese asistir podéis perfectamente, aunque no hayáis manifestado interés previo, acudir a la sala multiusos para estar con Judy, que es una mujer que, aparte de lo cordial que es, tiene una actitud de servicio brutal. Ayer estuvo atendiendo a todas las personas que se le acercaban con una verdadera actitud 2.0, que es el paraguas que envuelve a este acto. Judy, te voy a trasladar la pregunta que nos ha llegado y es que nos hables un poco acerca de las, del uso de las herramientas web 2.0 y de mmm, diferentes proyectos de aprendizaje colaborativo, pero entre colegios, entre clases, no dentro de la misma clase, sino entre colegios y entre clases. Yes, um, there are some of my uh, friends here from uh, Caius, who's, uh, where I spoke uh, in 2007. Um, some of my earlier work um, is with collaborative projects um, online, very much a passion of mine. So um, the, the use of Web 2.0 tools is just an option, just like any other tool. Um, one of the things that is particularly interesting um, to me is that Uh, some new studies of um, teenagers who use uh, Facebook, um, Twitter, uh, those kinds of 2.0 tools very actively at home and with their friends uh, don't want to use them in school. <laughs> so I think that um, whatever tools are available, we should choose among them in terms of what teachers feel will be most effective. But I don't think that there's anything particularly magical about Web 2.0 tools versus Web 1.0 tools. It's all about how well it fits with um, the uh, learning goals for a particular lesson project or activity. So did I understand your question correctly? Yes? Okay. Sure. Thank you very much for your speech and for your explanation about TIPAC model. So, y Judy estará disponible para todos vosotros en la sala multiusos y bueno, dado su carácter cordial, yo creo que va a atender a todo el mundo que se le acerque. So, <laughs> thank you, Judy. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.